Shabbat Shalom. It's good that everybody's here, and we look forward to a wonderful service together. Uh, let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu Ad Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Va'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. And the cornerstone of our faith, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto, Le'olam Va'ed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He began with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as friendless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, The second command is like unto the first. Be a hafto l'recha kamocha. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Baruch Hashem. We're going to sing songs of praise to the Lord. And you know, one of the things that comes up a lot, not just during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when we talk about return to the Lord, throughout the scripture, God is continually calling us to return. And we're going to be seeing today in today's portion as Jacob is returning back to the land after being gone for 20 years, there's a return and there, there are other areas of return. God's call that Messiah will return again, but also our hearts returning to him. And so we sing of the return. Open the door, return and restore. With love and affection, with full face attention, Shuva the Kuma, return and restore. Oh yes, return to your power, come back and shower us with love and affection, with full face attention, Shuva the Kuma, return and restore, cause it's you we adore. So far away, you said the day and return. Yes, you return. You said return now to me, so your life can be set free from all your captivity. And I will return to you, cause your exile now is. Build you just like new. So, Lord, return in your power. Come back.
back and shower us with love and affection, with full face attention. Shuva the Kumar, return and restore. It's you we adore. Shuva the Kumar, return and restore. It's you we live for. Oh Lord, return in your power. Come back and shower us with love and affection. We give full face attention. Return and restore, it's you we adore. Shuva the Kuma, return and restore, cause you're all we live for. Oh yes, return in your power, come back and shower us with love and affection. We make full this connection. Shuva the Kuma, return and restore, cause it's you we adore. Shuva the Kuma. Turn and restore, oh Lord, open the door, return and restore us, oh Lord. Baruch Hashem, he is coming back, and we are grateful for that. You know, when he comes back, no matter what it looks like around us, we're called to action. We're called to go into the night and bring the light of God's countenance. Not because we are the light or have the light, but in a way we reflect his light. And so he says, you are the light of the world. He wants us to be able to understand how we dispel darkness. We don't turn off darkness. We turn on the light. And when we allow him to light our being to light us up with his presence he opens up and light has a way of dispelling all darkness so don't worry about all the stuff going on in the world god's called us to shine noonday in the night Into the night, facing darkness and things we don't yet know. Still into the night, with all of our might, we now go. Oh, into the night, with darkness and fear all around. And into the night, uncertain of what will be found. Oh, yes, and into the night. Your unfiltered light will abound. And with the light of your power and grace, and in the light that shines from your face, oh, into the night, fill with your light we go. Yes, into the night, fill with your light we now go. And the darkness has to flee. As your light sets people free, and everyone will shine so bright. Like noonday in the night, just like noonday in the night. We go to set the captives free, open the eyes that cannot see, to bring about what soon must be. Like noonday in the night. We shine like noonday in the night. No matter what the darkness is around us, if we reflect his presence, God can dispel all darkness. And we can see God bring new insight that we couldn't see before. Set the captives free. Open the eyes that cannot see. To bring about what soon must be. Like noonday in the night. Yes, like noonday in the night. Oh, come illuminate the night. And shine like noonday in the night. Restore by your great light. Like noonday in the night. Oh, come and bring your light. So we can shine so bright. 
like noonday in the night. Just like noonday in the night. Oh, yes, and into the night. Restored by your light, we now go. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, it's so amazing when you think about it. We are called into things that we don't yet know, uncertain of what will be found. In today's portion, we're going to be talking about that a little bit with Jacob. He wasn't sure what to expect, but he trusted in the Lord, and God brought him through just like he promised he would do and like he promises he'll do for us. Because when it comes down to it, we're not having just one team against another. In fact, we're not at all in that battle. But there is nobody like him. There's none like our God, none like our Lord, none like our King, none like our Savior in anything. And we can rest in knowing that he is there for us and he'll bring us through every single time. There's none like our God. Ain Kelohenu. Savior in everything, none is love. 
Baruch Hashem. The Lord is so good, isn't he? He, There is none like him. And we need to embrace and take hold of all that he has for us. Shabbat Shalom. And we welcome everyone to Beth Zion. We're glad you're here with us in the service. And for all those joining us on the broadcast as well, we encourage you to invite people to come out and to be able to have that face-to-face, put them to put them connection that is always so special. Our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of Central Jersey and to the world, to be able to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes, because we believe that as people understand who the real Yeshua is, they begin to understand the depth of his love for us and the extent to which he is willing to reach out to find us, even when we go astray. He wants to draw us back to himself, and we're grateful for that. He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And I don't think of it just as an affirmation of some truth, but he is the way, the truth, and the life. And as we draw near to know him, he gives us the ability to share the one who takes residence within us. God comes to make his home in us. He said that, Yeshua said that I will send the comforter, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And that Shekhinah presence will be there. And he said, we will come and make our home in you. And you know, if somebody is in your home, you usually know it. Well, he wants to take full residence within us so that we can experience that and be able to allow others who don't know him to see that truth and be set free as well. That's part of our calling is to share in a way to put the message of Yeshua back into its original Jewish context so that people can understand both its Torah roots and the consistency of his message of love and restoration throughout the scripture. The Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant. And we're grateful for all of that. And I uh, just want to remind you that we have our tithes and offerings, our basket in the back. And for those who would like to use PayPal on our website at BethSion.org, you can do that. You can also do snail mail and put a stamp on it and send it to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we're thankful for all those who are generous in their prayers and in the finances and all those areas. So we're grateful for all of that. And God promises to pour out a blessing that there would not be room enough to contain. So I like the sound of that. I'm not doing it. I'm not giving so that I can get more back, but it's nice when he offers. So uh, I'll take him up on the offer. I guess we all should do that, right? Of course, right. All right. Avinu Malkainu, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word now and ask you to open up our hearts to be able to consider what it is that you want to speak to us from your heart to our heart. Put them to put them face to face. Speak deeply to us, Lord, as we look into these familiar passages and see the insights that you have for us. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Today's portion is called Vayishlach, which means he sent, where it says in the book of Bereshit in Genesis 32, verse 4, Yaakov sent messengers ahead of him to Esau, his brother, toward the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he gave instructions. And it's him sending out messengers to let him know this is where he is dividing up his family into sections, into groups, send them one after the other so that they would have some safety space between them because he wasn't sure what to expect coming back 20 years later to see his brother Esau. But God had something very special in mind, and we see all of these things transitioning. I can't help but think when I read through these sections between Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and especially with Jacob, it seems like a, like a soap opera, doesn't it? 
every, you know, one thing after another, uh, everything changes. If you watch some of these cliffhangers, you know, where everything looks like, oh, it gets resolved. And then, but wait a minute. And then all of a sudden, the shoe drops and you think, what's going to happen next week? And it's one thing after another. And we see that last week he was concerned when he left Laban, his father-in-law, that he was going to end up with nothing. And now Laban comes after him with all his men. And, and God makes a provision for him. God opens it up, shows Laban, don't mess with Jacob. He knew that he was blessed because God was blessing Jacob, and he knew that he was reaping the benefits of it. And so here we see with all of the finagling and things that were going on, he comes to a little Machiah moment where he says, ah, oh, I can relax. Everything's fine until after Laban leaves. And now he's getting ready to go see Esau. It's like one after the other. But I want to mention the title for this. It's get up, go out, move on. And what we see is that in our life, there are, if you can see in the picture here, there's uh, somebody walking, you see the footsteps. You see as he's walking through an unknown forest, walking through places maybe he hasn't gone before. And it's very much like our lives as well. We're going through in places that we've never seen before. And we don't always know what to expect. But God is there for us. And he's not going to let us down. He is going to make a way for us as we yield ourselves to him. And so we see this idea of walking through a forest. We have trees. We have all different obstacles, things that we can't see as clearly as you could if you were just looking down a plane and seeing a big open area. I remember when I was in Bible school, we were two miles from the Mexican border. And you could look out into miles and miles into Mexico. It was all flat going in. You could see mountains in the back. And I remember one time during the 4th of July, I was thinking about when I was back home and we used to go and watch the fireworks. And I said, Lord, I miss the fireworks. And I went out that day and I was walking in the field and I looked out towards Mexico and there were these thunderstorms. But you're talking about 100 miles in all the way through and these different storms. It was sort of like my own personal fireworks show that he provided for me in the middle of nowhere. And I, I just remembered that you could just see so far. But in life, we don't always see that far in advance. We see through a glass dimly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall we know even as we are known. I like to quote that a lot because it's very much the way it is for us. A lot of people think that everybody knows what they're doing. They've got it all together. I'm the only one that doesn't have it together. But every one of us goes through those same moments of consternation and fear, those uncertainties that come along in life. And what God does, he doesn't just say hide from the uncertainties or ignore the uncertainties. He says to press in for the calling set before us, to press into the Lord, to draw near to him. And so when we see this, what I want to do is I want to look for a moment at Genesis 35. We'll reference some of these little points, but there was something in there that stood out. And I'll go through some of these aspects. And I want you to think about this as we go through some of the aspects that happened in Jacob's life and recognize that we go through very similar things in our own life. And yet God is working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. From Romans 8, he makes that statement. And we don't always know what the next step is going to be. We just keep taking it step by step, step by step in the path that God lays out for us. And so in Genesis 35, he starts off by saying, God said to Yaakov, get up, go up to Bethel and live there. So there's where we get part of the title. Get up, go up, get up, don't slumber, don't waste time, don't procrastinate. Go up to Bethel. 
And what is it about Bethel? Bethel was the place where when Jacob first left his land and family to go to Haran, to find his wife, to see Laban, his uncle, and to go there, he had that vision, remember from last week, of the ladder with angels ascending and descending. And God made a promise to him that I will bring you back to this land and that I will not leave you until I've done what I said I would do. And so here he's going back. He recognized that it was the time to go back. He never imagined going from this idea of get up, go out, move on. He never realized that it was going to be 20 years till he was heading back again. He, I'm sure, thought it was going to be a shorter period of time. And I mentioned this before. I'm sure his mother thought so, too. And we'll see as we go through this that there is, in this chapter, a reference to Yitzchak. Yaakov came home to his father, it says in verse 27. And he was there, and then after, it says that Yitzchak, Isaac, lived 180 years. And Esau and Yaakov buried their father. But there is no reference to their mother. And I, at least in the Torah, there's no reference to his mother or having an encounter with her. And it's possible that she was the one who wasn't around, that she may have died already because we see no reference as close as he was with his mother, no reference to her but to this idea that Yaakov came home to his father. And, and I think that it's important because nothing we can imagine can make up for what it is that God is doing. We can have all kinds of ideas of what it will be. But like they say, you plan and then life happens. All these different things shift and change. And what we want to do is to be able to be focused to know when it's time to get up, when it's time. Because sometimes when we're in a situation, even if it's, what would you call it? Um, even if it's a situation that isn't good. And his situation with his father-in-law wasn't very good. He kept changing his wages. He kept doing all these different things. He kept working angles that were not part of the contract. And yet, without complaining, he kept moving forward. But sometimes a person can, you know, they call it Stockholm Syndrome, you know, where you begin to, if somebody was, uh, was, was captured by somebody, uh, they were being held hostage, where the person who was kidnapped has a certain affinity towards their kidnapper. They call it Stockholm Syndrome, uh, similar to when there's abuse in family life, where there is a wife, maybe, or a husband who is being abused by their spouse. And the idea of moving and getting up out of that situation is hard to fathom because the devil you know and the devil you don't know. The situation that you're in, you're familiar with it, even though it's very uncomfortable. But there comes a point where we have to stand up. We have to get up and go up to what it is that's next in store for us. And God is continually calling us. Everything in life is unknown. And until we come to know the Lord, even he is unknown. But he's drawing us back to himself. And he's calling us to come up and to fellowship with him and to experience his presence. And so he tells him, God says to Jacob, get up, go up to Bethel and live there. Now, what is it about Bethel? Bethel, I mentioned before, was the place where he had the promise from God that he would bring him back again safely. And now he's coming back and God says, I want you to go live there. Now, before this, is his encounter with Esau. And some of the way that it looked, and how many do we, times do we look around and say, oh, this can't work out. Circumstances come along, and this is just not right. It's, and and we, we go off on tangents. You can watch in the news how people will 
put a spin on everything so that when you look at it, you don't actually see the facts. And if you take time to look at the facts, they've been filtered already by screens that have been put in place or screens that have to be taken out or put in to be able to understand what is going on. And life is like that. But when we look at it, imagine what this looked like. I'm going to touch on a few things that happened before this point in chapter 35. But in some of those other places in chapter 32, we saw that after Laban left, he now sends out four groups of his family, one after the other, with gifts for his brother. He sends and says, find out, let them know. And he says, your brother is coming with 400 men. Now, if you think about it, back at the time when Abraham went to rescue Lot, he had about 318, I think it was, men. And you think about Gideon with his 300. I mean, this could be easily a war party. You're going to bring 400 of your closest friends to greet your brother coming back. I mean, it didn't seem very good to Jacob. And as he is there alone with his family going forward, he's praying. And he has this encounter. It says that a man or a messenger came and wrestled with Jacob. Now, there's a couple ways of looking at this. He wrestles with God. It says he's seen the face of God. Peneli referred to it as. But it also is a struggle in a number of ways. It's a struggle with the adversary. In a way, the angel of Esau, some of the rabbinic writings talk about. It's not spelled out in the scripture this way. But there is this idea that as he's going to encounter his brother, and the last thing he remembers him saying was, when dad's gone, you're dead. I'm going to kill you. He doesn't know, and, and, and I, I mention this whenever I think of this, that whatever the last encounter you had with somebody was is immediately where your mind goes to. It's the last, it's like I just had my class reunion, 51 years. And if you haven't seen, some people I didn't see in 50 years. And what happens when you see them, you actually have a moment of regression they may be an attorney, a judge. They may be a doctor. They may be uh, one fellow is now the mayor of his town and all of these things. But back and in, in high school, you know, you would approach somebody and, hey, punch him in the chest and say, hey, how you doing? You know, you do that now when they're, they're 68 or 69 years old, you might cause a coronary. <laughs> but there's something about going back to what was the familiar place. And what happens is, if you're thinking about going back again, your references are distorted because you've moved on, but somehow in our own mind, we can't imagine they have moved on too. They have. But you come together and everybody is suddenly 17 again. Everybody's looking and saying, hey, you know, looking to cheerleader and say, yeah, let's uh, you want to go around back? And it's like, what? You know, these are 60 something year old people. <laughs> but all of a sudden, you know, you see the the football star with a belly out to here and, and really not like he was svelte when he was back then when everybody was looking and saying, wow, what a guy, <laughs> what a guy. Things change, but our reference points, we have to be careful because we want to understand what it is God is doing. And so when it comes to that, we can't allow ourselves to be directed simply by what we remember the past as being. That's why the struggle was so difficult for Jacob. He wasn't sure if... He was going to wipe him out and wipe out his family and all that he had. And yet, even with the promise of God, even with this idea that I want you to go back now and God would make provision for him, there is this struggle going on 
wrestling with God, wrestling with the adversary, wrestling with himself, wrestling with all of the images of what were there in his mind from before and wondering if things could have at all changed. 20 years is a long time. And he's coming back. And he's uncertain. And so he has this encounter and he calls the place Peniel, the face of God, where he wrestled and became someone who prevailed. And God changes his name from Jacob to Israel because he has prevailed with God and he has sent him forth. Uh, he said, I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. To encounter these moments with God can be scary. But at the same time, they're the pathway that we have to go through that are uncharted waters. They're uncharted as we walk through that forest in life with all of its obstacles and all of its challenges. We get up and we cling to the Lord. We go out to where God is calling us and we move on to the next phase of what God has in store for us. There's never really a long lasting plateau. You reach a goal, you say, if I can get past this, that's all I need to do. But when we get past that, God has more directive in mind. He has things he wants to bring us to. He has ways of bringing and bringing, of bringing reconciliation to things that seem unreconcilable. And certainly the last thing he heard from his brother and the urgency of his mom sending him out told him that this was not a good thing. And if that's the last thing in his mind, it's now time to approach the man who said those things. He had no idea whether he had changed or not, whether he held on to his grudge whether seeing him would be the end of him. And he wrestled back and forth with the idea of God is calling him back. Do you ever struggle over some things? Even if God shows you insights, you know he's with you. But then these circumstances seem so large. And we don't always understand, do we? But when we go through it, we see a few things. It says, and I find this fascinating also, he tells them some of the procedures that go into getting up, going up, and moving on. And what he does is, if you look at it, he tells them in chapter 35 of Genesis, go up, uh, get up, go up to Bethel and live there. Live in the house of God. Live in the presence of the Lord and make there an altar to God who appeared to you when you fled Esau, your brother. Then Yaakov said to his household and all the others with him, get rid of all the foreign gods that you have with you. Purify yourselves and put on fresh clothes. We're going to move on and go up to Bethel. There I will build an altar to God who answered me when I was in such distress and stayed with me wherever I went. What's described in this is this idea of getting up, going up, and moving on to the place of God's presence, moving on to where God was calling him to be. But before he could do that, he said, we have to get rid of all the foreign gods. All those things that have made impurity within our walk. Purify yourselves. Put on fresh clothes. Put on a whole new look. Prepare yourself for the new things that God has. Now, what's significant about get rid of the foreign gods? There's a couple ways of looking at it. One thing we see is that Rachel, the wife that he really loved, and Leah, who, who bore him the children and the struggle between Leah and Rachel. Rachel was the one, if you remember, who, when they left, took the family gods, the idols with her. She said she had her period at the time and she couldn't get off her camel. And underneath she had 
the idols. They didn't find them. But it's interesting that here, he says, get rid of all the foreign gods. Get rid of all of those things that have been hindrances to you in the past. This is one of the key things we have to do if we're going to get up and go up. If we're going to move on to the next phase that God has for our lives, we have to get rid of those things that are the hindrances, the sins that so easily beset us. To run with patience the race set before us, looking to Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith. And as we look to him, he gives us the ability to stand up, to get up, to move forward. But if you go out without and still clinging to all of those things that give false security. You know, having the household idols was a sign of control in the region and of your family. And she felt like having those idols represented a security. But there was no security in an idol. And there was a compromise. And they got rid of them all. And it says that they took them and they buried them by a tree. It also mentions this, that as they were journeying towards the house of God, Bethel, that Rachel was giving birth to her second son. She had Joseph, and now it was Benjamin. And she died in childbirth. And in that place, when she looked at what was going on, she was going to call him the son of my sorrow because she was dying. And what we see is that Jacob called him Benjamin. And in verse 18, he said, she died in childbirth. And as she was dying, she named him Benoni, son of my grief. But his father called him Benjamin, son of the right hand, son of the south. Rachel died and she was buried in Ephrat, that is Bethlehem, Bethlehem. And he set up a stone for the grave and moved on. Now, Leah was the one who eventually was laid to rest in the family cemetery, if you will. Rachel gave up her idols but she never made it to the house of God. She never made it to the place of Bethel. She was on the road there. But that was it. We don't want to sell short the things that God is doing. We want to be able to get up. We want to be able to go out from what has been the hindrances in our life and experience what it is to move on into the new things that God has for us. And that transition can be difficult. You know, today people talk about, about equity, which is not the same as equality. But there's a word that I like to use. I mentioned this last year when we had my album come out with uh, Hashlema, Restoration. It actually also has another word, not equity or equality, but equanimity. And equanimity is, I mentioned before, comes from, from the word shalemut, which is also from the same root as, uh, as shalom, to be full, complete, perfect. And it speaks of restoring stability and balance. When we look to the Lord for that equanimity to come from him. He brings stability. He brings balance. He brings insight. He brings us to the place where as we move on, we move on to where we're supposed to be. And we go without trepidation and without fear. We go because God has proven himself faithful in everything he's done. And as we go forward, he begins to open up these doors for us. I want to mention passage in Philippians because this again I think tells us in a short fashion Philippians 3 it says but the things that used to be advantage for me 
So you can get used to having a way of working your deals, of working out how you're going to do it, your workarounds for everything, your passive-aggressive approach to things so it doesn't look like you really want it, but you make sure you get it. All of these little tricks that people do are things that have to be laid aside. The things that used to be advantage to me, Paul says, I have, because of the Messiah, come to consider a disadvantage. Why is it a disadvantage? Was he saying that all of the accolades, all of his education, all of those things were not of any value? They were of value. And anybody in that time period would have loved to have the resume that he would had. But he recognized there was something bigger. And he was able to get up. Remember when he was knocked to the ground? And he said, why, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? Well, he got up. He was blind. He was taken to a place. And he was told that God would show him the things that he would suffer. In that transformation that happened there and during the next 13 years or so, all of the things that happened in his life, all of the challenges that he faced, all of the difficulties he went through, all of the attacks that came to him. He asked for them to be removed, but God said, my grace is sufficient for you. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Messiah may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then am I strong. He doesn't walk around saying he's weak. But what he recognizes is that in the things that he experiences, his inability to perform, God is present there to be whatever it is he needs in that time, that difficulty, that place. And so he says, I consider everything a disadvantage in comparison with the supreme value of knowing the Messiah Yeshua as my Lord. It was because of him I gave up everything and regarded all as garbage in order to gain the Messiah and be found in union with him. Think about this. When Rachel took those idols, she thought she was taking something of incredible value. And in her culture, it was the most important element for holding power within the family and within that community. But it was garbage. It wasn't God. There was no power in it. It's what people gave it power to be, how they looked at it and saw it. So in this case, Paul looks at the things he has, and he says, what was gained for me, I count as garbage in order to gain the Messiah, to be found in union with him, not having my righteousness my, uh, based on my own legalism, but having that righteousness which comes through the Messiah, his faithfulness, the righteousness from God based on trust. And he says, I gave it all up in order to know him. How do you get up from what's comfortable? Or even if it's uncomfortable, it's familiar. How do you go out not knowing if it's going to be better or worse. The reality is that with God, it will always be better, even if there are challenges along the way that seem like indicating that it's worse. God is there for us, and he wants us to move on to the next phase. And we find, as I mentioned before, we find that as we move forward, things that seem mundane, seeing things that seem to have no real value or worth as we go through them turn out to be the prerequisite that God was using to train us so that we could experience the next phase as we move on to what God is doing. And we could look around and say, there's an army of 400 men coming. I better run off in another direction. No, you face and move forward because God said to move forward. Move on to where your destiny is. Our destiny is not what we come up with as our goal. Our destiny is in Messiah. Our destiny is in knowing him. And he says this. He says, 
I gave it all up in order to know him. That is to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering as I am being conformed to his death. You say, well, that sounds kind of negative, but it is the resurrection power. See, you can't have resurrection unless you die. You can't have restoration unless you've been severed from what it was that seemed to be so important. Sometimes the importance we put on it is in our own mind, in our own imaginations. And God wants to sever those ties like they buried those idols so that they could experience the richness, so that Paul could experience the richness of the resurrection power of God. And all of us who have known or who know Messiah have experienced what it is to lay aside the sin that so easily besets us, to call on him and repent of our sins and to call upon him to come and transform our hearts, to transform our lives. And we have seen that over time. But even as believers, we can find ourselves in places where we question where we stand right now. Or we question all the circumstances around us that are shouting at us, that are screaming at us, that's saying it's hopeless. God says, no, no, move on. Get up, shake off the dust, go out and move on to what God has in store for us. He's been preparing each one of us all along the way for the hope and the heritage and the blessing that he has in store for us. And what does he say here? He says, he, and it's kind of interesting because we keep thinking that we could attain what it is. If we can get to this level, it'll be all right. If I could get this much funding, everything will be fine. If I could take care of my retirement fund and not worry about it, everything will be okay. All the different things that we look at are like garbage. And I don't mean these things are all garbage, but in contrast to what it is that God is offering us, his presence, his residence within us, and all of the blessings of the kingdom. But look at what he says. He kept thinking, too, that he had attained and maybe wasn't sure, but here's how he describes it. He says that I may know the, the power of his resurrection so that somehow, verse 11, I might arrive at being resurrected from the dead. It is not that I have already obtained it or already reached the goal. No, I keep pursuing it in the hope of taking hold of that for which Messiah Yeshua took hold of me. We sometimes look and say, yes, I received the Lord. But in reality, we received what he was giving of himself. He took us. He brought us for a purpose and a reason. And he says, I keep pursuing it in the hope of taking hold of that for which Messiah took hold of me. Brother, I, for my part, do not think of myself as having yet gotten hold of it. They say, Paul, but look at you. You are so amazing. You're writing all these letters. You're doing all this thing. The power of God is working. He didn't stop and rest on any laurels. He didn't stop and be deflected by all of the challenges. What he said was, I, for my part, do not think of myself as having yet gotten hold of it. But one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining forward toward what lies ahead, I keep pursuing the goal in order to win the prize offered by God's upward calling in the Messiah Yeshua. In one sense, he's saying, forgetting what's behind, here it says, I strain forward towards, I press toward the mark, I move on, I get up. I go out and I move on to what it is that God has called me to do. I've not yet fully apprehended it, but he's apprehended me. He's taken hold of me for a purpose. Forgetting what's behind, learn from it, but don't relish or think about it or ruminate on all the things we've missed. 
Look forward to what it is that God is preparing for us in the future. I keep pursuing the goal. My goal? Not my goal. I keep pursuing the goal in order to win the prize offered by God's upward calling. Go up. Up to the calling of God in the Messiah Yeshua. Therefore, as many as of us are mature, let us keep paying attention to this. And if you are differently minded about anything, God will also reveal this to you. He's saying if you come to conflicts that seem to counter what you think God is doing or that he somehow may have forgotten about you. Do you ever come to that place where you've been a believer for a while and you come to a moment where you, you, you start to question, say, I don't know. Did I where did I mess up? I mean, I, I don't know if he loves me. I think all of us come to those moments of question when challenges and circumstances happen. But he tells us to keep pushing towards that upward calling of the Messiah Yeshua. As many of us as are mature, let us keep paying attention to this. And if you are differently minded about anything, it means you're questioning, you're uncertain. God will also reveal this to you. Only let our conduct fit the level we have already reached. We have seen God's faithfulness in the things that we've gone through already. We have seen his track record that he is with us for a purpose and for a plan that is in his heart to do. And when he is in that place and we reflect on it, we can do like King David who said, return to your rest, O my soul. And maybe David's soul said, why should I? Everything's going wrong. He said, return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. What's he saying? He's saying, if he dealt bountifully with me in the past, it's his heart to do and deal bountifully with me in the future. And we can rest in knowing that God is committed to us. He did the ultimate commitment in laying his life down for us. And what does he say? As many as you mature, God will reveal this even to you. Only let our conduct fit the level we have already reached. Don't step back from it. Don't settle for the level we've reached, but keep pressing toward the mark for the high calling of God that's in the Messiah Yeshua. And then he says, brothers, join in imitating me and pay attention to those who live according to the pattern we have set for you. The pattern of trusting the Lord in everything that we do. In case you're wondering, in 1 Peter 5, verse 6, he says, therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. When we look at what Jacob did, he humbled himself. When he was saying to his brother, take all these gifts I've given you. And his brother said, I don't need any of it. I've got everything. He would not let it go and said, you have to take it. He was unwilling to let it go because he knew that God was his provider. And it made for the reconciliation. But look at what he did. He humbled himself. And when they did meet, to his amazement, he didn't come with a sword, a duel, a pistol to duel with or anything like that. He approached him and he said, bring the registration of your chariot and we'll run this as a drag. No, no, he didn't do that either. He looked at it, and what does he do? Esau comes and hugs him and kisses him. He's glad to see his brother. This was not what Jacob had in mind. But all of that ruminating over what the possible terrible things may be, don't waste our time on those thoughts, those anxious thoughts. He says in 1 Peter 5, 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the right time he may lift you up. You get up. But he'll lift you up. He'll give you what you need to be able to stand against those things, to stand up and to go out and to move on. And he says he'll lift you up. Throw all your anxiety upon him because he cares about you. 
stay sober, stay alert. Now, that doesn't mean simply don't get drunk. He's saying stay sober, stay alert, keep a clear mind, knowing the truth of what God says in his commitment to us. When we do that and are in that place of being sober and alert, it says your enemy, the adversary, is stalking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Stand against him, firm in your trust. Stand against him. Does that mean that you get up and you strike a kung fu move and you say, I will take you on, Hasatan? <laughs> no, we don't do that. What is the strength that we have? He says, stand against him. How? Firm in your trust. Trust in your ability to say like they did in the Matrix. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> no, it was trusting in the Lord. Knowing that your brothers throughout the world are going through the same kinds of suffering. You're not the only one going through these difficult times. Others are going through it. Some with despair and some with victory and overcoming knowing your brothers throughout the world are going through the same kinds of things you will have to suffer only a little while after that god who is full of grace the one who called you to his eternal glory and union with the messiah will himself restore establish and strengthen you and make you firm he told him be firm in your trust god will make you firm He'll strengthen you. To him be power forever and ever. Amen. This is what he said in 1 Peter 5. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Don't think that you have to do it yourself, that you have to work it out. It says in union with Messiah, we have all of these things. In union with Messiah, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah, the manifest presence of God, is available to lead us and guide us into all truth, to show us of his, of his and reveal it to us. These things are so amazing that when we think about it, we may not think about it. We may think that our little goals to get to where we want to be is where we, it's better than it was, so it's, that's all I need. Hineni, it's enough. But God says it's not enough. And he's not saying that we're being greedy. He's saying, get up, go out, and move on in the power of God's spirit to the next phase of what God is doing in your life. We're seeing in many ways a rebirth within our congregation. New people coming in. A new casting of the vision. I don't know what the Lord fully has in mind. But I know whatever it is, it's good. It's acceptable. It's perfect. God's will is there for us. But we have to lay aside the idols, lay aside the sin that so easily besets us, to run with patience the race set before us, looking to the one thing needed, looking to Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, and everything in between, the end and the beginning, and all in between. He is there for us as we yield ourselves to him. We're on our way to Bethel, to the house of God, to the place of God's dwelling. And he calls each one of us to be a Bethel, to be a house of God. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father and our King, we thank you for this time and your word. We ask you to open up our hearts to receive what you have spoken to filter out any of my own words, but to speak to us, Lord, and transform us. Help us to be able to get up and go out from those places, to lay aside all of those things that hinder us and to move on in the next phase of what you have for us. Lord, we want to see revival. We want to see restoration. We want to see the power of God poured out. We want to see people healed and delivered. We want to see people come to salvation, to wholeness in you, to that place of equanimity where they are restored with stability and balance and 
just what you're able to do, making us fully orbed, well-rounded in every way, ministering to the areas that we think we're weak in, and you strengthen those, thinking the things that we are so skilled in and finding out that we're weak there too, but that you are all that's necessary to complete our need. And Lord, we ask you to make your presence known, open up our hearts, and give us eyes to the heart to look at the world around us and to have a word in season for those who may be in distress, those who may be perplexed and troubled, and to do like Jacob did and push through and not let go until the blessing comes. Pour your spirit out, God, and do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine by the power of your spirit working in us as we walk in union with Messiah. Every day we should ask Messiah into our life. Every day we should ask him for guidance, for instruction. We should seek to allow the Spirit of God to speak deeply to us in every encounter that we have and every divine appointment to be mindful that you are moving and circulating us in the world around us to be able to allow for people to be touched by you. Lord, we want to see people set free. We want to see people, the spiritual chains removed. We want to see families reunited, families restored. Our state, our community, our nation, this world, moving in sync with your spirit. We thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's all stand. And as Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Ve'yosem l'cha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'shem sar shalom in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying amen and amen. And remember, in every cliffhanger, the hero always comes through. Doesn't know how. God wants us to be heroes, not in our own strength, but by letting God shine through and moving us on to the next thing that he has for us. Shabbat shalom. Greet one another and... Join us afterwards, and we'll see you in shul. Invite people out. God bless.